Welcome Joystick Justice League to the debut episode of our brand new show called Shortlist. I'm Mike Fursios. I'm Joe Morin. So this is a show where, you know, we, we wanted to do some kind of like top five, top ten thing, but really take it to greater heights, like really get to the heart of, of certain things issues and topics within the game industry and really what better way to start off with with joe than what with what makes a game truly great and legendary absolutely and uh you know and uh and better than just kind of uh listing like, like let's say like the top so legendary games i, I think uh, the uh, the idea of this uh, episode here is that we're really gonna delve into actually what makes all these genres and all these games that would actually make some great so just listing off a bunch of games right yeah i mean it's 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 really it's it's not only just kind of a, a historical document of, of what made this whole medium great over time and over generations but also really kind of like a, a letter to, to future developers in terms of you know any anybody who's who's stuck with with what their next great idea might be or or anybody who's worried that games aren't original anymore and that or mm -hmm. games are lacking originality or, or newness I, I think this list is really trying to get like you're saying at the core tenets of what makes great games tick yeah the, these are definitely like you said for upcoming developers though that in almost i would say just about every game on this list are good games to look at you know these are all games that you know that, that uh, were, were original and that really kind of uh, broke some new ground. Yeah, just really trying to figure ways. out like why they worked in their particular time, by what, by what, but also why they stand the test of time. You know, people yes. are always saying, well, why do you go back and play old games? Like, there, there's something that just, you know, there, that's about them that is yeah. still mimicked to this day, and we really want to try to get the heart at. So we've kind of made a list uh, of 15 major factors that we feel create a truly legendary game. So let's start at the bottom of the list. Start, let's start with number 15, pushing existing or even late gen technology to previously unheard of heights, a game that does this. So Joe, what, what kind of comes to mind with a game that really, really kind of blows it out of the park? Uh, one of the first ones uh, that, that uh, come to mind for me are, are definitely uh, in the, uh, it would have been the sixth generation uh, with uh, on the PS2, and that was God of War 2. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there, there a game that really nailed story and, and gameplay, and uh, really, uh, you know, for that generation, or you know, the, the PS2 in particular, really showcased, you know, what, what that hardware could do. I mean, there was a lot going on in that game. Yeah, you know what? That was that was a really interesting time because I mean, you know, everybody kind of knew that even though the PS2 was the most popular console at the time, the Xbox had more horsepower, and you know, it was getting flaunted in PlayStation North's faces. You know how awesome Halo was, and it was pretty damn amazing, and and stuff like Project Gotham that was coming out, and you know, a moral win that couldn't just couldn't be done on PS2. Um, to see something like God of War 2 coming out was just like, if you were a Sony fanboy, that was like, oh, breath of relief. It's like, wow, there's still some juice left in the system, especially because that game came out right after the launch of the PS3, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. I mean, you've got high definition graphics right in your face and then, you know, it, yeah. but to, to actually ignore the PS3 for a few hours and go back to God <laughs> of War 2, quite the feat. Yeah. yeah, it was quite the feat. And, uh, and another one, uh, turning back the clock a little bit, going back to uh, the Genesis with uh, Sonic. You know, the, the, there's a game that uh, you know that uh, legitimately gave Mario, you know, kind of it, it was almost uh, like the the people in Genesis almost gave them their kind of version of Mario on the Genesis. And, and then there's an example that that game really, you know, that that made the Genesis look good. Well, it was really the game that defined the whole, you know. The way of de remember how it was the Genesis Super Nintendo War, and, and mm -hmm. each side had certain things that they would argue. Oh, the Super Nintendo's better because it displays 256 colors on screen at a time, and it has a more orchestral soundtrack. But for the Genesis people, we knew that it had a faster processor. So that was our mm -hmm. our like people like me who had a Genesis and didn't have a Super Nintendo. I'd argue, oh, you know, you can't do a game like Sonic on Super Nintendo. That thing was fast. You know, the blo the blast processor term for better or for worse came from that and yep. and I and I think that you're right by bringing that up that Sonic the Hedgehog really created a new identity for Sega like on on these fast-paced uh, hardcore games but not only that Joe sports games what do you remember about the differences between sports games on the Genesis and on the Super Nintendo especially with hockey 
No, it's uh, you know, I I, I played on both. Um, then I played both on the the, the Super uh, NES and the Genesis. I mean, for the sports games, I mean, it was mainly on. Uh, for, for me, it was Super Nintendo. Was it? Yeah. No, that, that's what uh, we. I mean, uh, it. Uh, I, I think they were both pretty equal, equally good. I mean, uh, what did, you, did you play sports games more on the Genesis? Or the, I did. Uh, the I played Nintendo? them both because I, I knew a lot of people who had NHL hockey on the Super Nintendo, and there was like a, at yeah. least in the first couple of iterations, there was like a marked difference. You know, mm-hmm. I remember especially NHL PA '93 was just smooth on the Genesis because it had seven mega. It was like a seven hertz mega hertz. 7 hertz processor, something like that. And yeah. then Super Nintendo only had 3.5, so it was really choppy. Like, the frame rate was just awful. Yeah. And, and, yeah, like, there were certain games that just, just couldn't be done because of that speed. I mean, it caught up over time as they harnessed the Super Nintendo's capabilities. But really, it was games like that and even Gunstar Heroes for Sega Genesis, like, yes. near the end of the generation lifespan where it, it thought, like, everything... Like, at that time in 93, when Gunstar Heroes came out... We really thought that we'd seen the the end of the Genesis lifespan. You know, games like Donkey Kong Country were coming out on Super Nintendo, mm-hmm. and you know, just these these incredibly epic games. To see something like Gunstar Heroes come out and take every possible trick that they had learned in like the last six or seven years and just throw this into one epic experience. That's still why that game has its following and stands the test of time because it's just it was just so. Not only like graphically incredible, but just a great game. It really just, it's not, it, I think this category is not just about pushing the hardware forward, but just being graphically great and great as a game. Yeah, and that, that, for, for me, that, 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 that generation of the Super Nintendo and the Genesis, I've mentioned this before, but I mean, it was one of the best examples I could think of, of, of both sides really kind of pushing each other. To, to kind of outdo each other and to come up with the best games. It, it was just, it was a really competitive generation. And uh, I mean, damn it, you know, both, both consoles were, were, were awesome. And there were, there were, you know, it's surprising actually, even looking back on it now, just what, what the systems could actually do. Yeah, you know what? And that really tells you something about how this, this, this current eighth generation could be going you know it's mm-hmm. it's it's kind of a fact now that the xbox one maybe doesn't have the processing capabilities that the ps4 does and the wii u is kind of in the distance third but joe when you put out games that just take advantage of what you have and you just inject fun into them again look at how the genesis survived uh, mm-hmm. the big bully of the Super Nintendo near the end of the, uh, the fourth generation because he just put out great games using the technology it had at hand, putting those 64 colors to use properly. I mean, you see games like, you know, I mean, I remember obviously Super Castlevania 4 was the big Castlevania game of that era, but there's also people with a heavy allegiance to the Genesis Bloodlines version because sometimes less is more. When you when you, when you you have less to work with, you're forced to be more creative, and they, they really put that hardware to the test. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you know, and looking more recently, to to I would say the the, the PS3. I mean, uh, and not just this game in particular, which I'm talking about, The Last of Us, but uh, you know, starting with with uh, with uh, the seventh gen, Naughty Dog has really turned into a, a developer that they really seem to to catch on to you know what it takes to get the full potential of the systems and I, and I think we're, we're probably going to see that again when it comes to, to PS4 yeah I mean you can tell The Last of Us like when I was playing it the first time and I beat it on PS3 um, it, it looked great don't get me wrong but I, I kept saying that you know I can tell that this was designed for next gen like it's it's grainy you can tell it's pushing the PS3 a little hard uh, not, to, not to take anything away from it but I, I think it, it just makes sense. It was inevitable that a PS4 version of Last of Us was going to come out because that game was just a beast. You know, yeah. it, it, it was argued that it could not have been done on the 360. You know, just like mm-hmm. there, there, that again, like Naughty Dog really was the saving grace of the PS3 in the seventh generation. I mean, when the days were dark, we had two th- PS3 owners had two things they could rely on: Gran Turismo 5 and Uncharted. And, and you know, God of War yeah. three, and then things opened up a little more. But you know, those were dark days, and that's the thing. You know, Naughty Dog kind of became the bungee of this generation, just really pu- showing us where where the next generation was kind of going. It, now they they were really thinking ahead and just really tricking out the hardware. So that's number fifteen. Let's move on to number fourteen on our list of characteristics of that make legendary games that stand the test of time. Let's talk about games that enhance real life social relationships or create enriching virtual ones and even create new ways of communicating and socializing in general. 
This is a really, really interesting one, and uh, you know, one of the best early examples, actually the two best early examples I can think of are definitely The Sims and EverQuest. Oh, yeah. Uh, with, with the EverQuest, I mean, this was uh, one of the first really, really good uh, online RPG games that really took this idea of building, uh, you know, possibly real life, but, uh, but uh, you know, outside of that, you know, really kind of... Uh, Bringing the idea of of, of uh, socializing into a game, just like a new arena of socializing. I mean, like it's not only mm -hmm. just just chatting over a microphone or a, or a headset and, and playing online, but using avatars and and even playing a persona. Like you know, I'm sure that yep. there's a little bit of acting when you really get entrenched into it, into that kind of culture, right? Um, there's a certain there's a certain side of that you possibly create that you wouldn't normally show in real life because you you have that that virtual wall in front of you where you don't have to show yourself you can present yourself through an avatar it, it, it just it, it uh, allows you to uh, to you know I mentioned this about games before and you know, it's actually one of the kind of the reasons that uh, a lot of us play games is, is that uh, you just we, we can do stuff in the game that we just we can't do in real life and it, and it, with some of these games in particular that's one of their big appealing factors is that you can just do things that you just you can't really do that's what it is it's like you can get together with your crew in World of Warcraft, and just and just farm and, and socialize all day. Look at even like GTA 5 online. One of the fun, one of the most fun aspects of that sometimes is not doing a mission, going to one of your buddies' safe houses, turning on the TV, and, and just sitting there having a chat and watching your avatar's lips through move <laughs> as if you're sitting there. You can close your eyes and imagine that you're sitting in Los Santos, and, and it's just it's really interesting. What what I really want to talk about too with with number 14 on this list is the idea of the party game and how that enriches social atmosphere what do you what do you what can you tell us about party games you know, part, uh, and uh, you know what uh, some of the best example of these party games and, and I, I think this has a lot more to do with kind of like the uh, not necessarily the online but uh, getting like talking about the, you know the couch kind of co-op and kind of I think definitely games like uh, you know Mario Kart rock band you know Mario party you know, those kind of games it just it, it uh, it's it just it, it's a fun way to, to really kind of play games with people. It's just direct competition, you know, like like Rock Band, and like seeing who can get the highest score, and you just you get that immediate feedback of how well you're doing against uh, the people that you're playing. It's just it's it's a for, for, it's one of the more enjoyable kind of ways that I like to play games is just getting together with people and just going head to head competition. Right. So what makes a great party game? Like what's gonna get your non gamer friends in the living room having a couple of beers to actually sit down there and pick up a controller? Like what made Rock Band accessible? What made Mario Party accessible? What made Wii Sports accessible over say, you know, throwing on Street Fighter two and watching half the room go up because they're too afraid to play it with you? Just, just the way that play me, and just the way that the games uh, control. You know, they're they're very accessible for for uh, the new kind of player. It's not, it's not uh, the, the they're not too steep of a, of a learning curve, which which helps make it accessible and helps actually make it fun for you know not necessarily for for people that uh, maybe aren't aren't quite the hardcore gamer that you know some of us are. It just it, it just it makes it. Uh, like I said, it just makes it accessible because it's just it's they weren't too com they just they weren't really that complicated to pick up and play. And I, yeah, I think it's you're right. It's 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 basically about keeping it simple, the interface simple, so you don't have to teach people button commands and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like look at rock bands. Like you know how to sing, pick up the mic. You know how to hit some buttons, pick up the guitar. You know it's not that big of a deal. Uh, Mario yeah. Kart, press a button, you got the gas. Press another button, you got reverse, and you, you turn the car. Mario Party, it's built off of board game mechanics. You know, again, the, most games don't even require you. To, like I remember one of my favorite games was Battle Balls on. I think it was Mario Party. Two, oh gosh, yeah. where you yeah. can just you can have a drink in one hand and use the analog <laughs> stick and just control your battle ball, just just fun. Yeah. You know that's what yeah. made Pong such a massive hit back in the '70s because anybody could put in a quarter and figure it out with 10 minutes. But it was also constructed well, you know, and that's that's what it is. And that's the beauty of those games, that just uh, of making, you know, some games now can tend to be kind of overcomplicated, but some of these games, it just, it's built on a very simple premise and just makes it very, very accessible to, to pretty well anybody to pick up and play. And you know what? It also invites, um, it invites instances of humor. You know, look at Rock oh, Band, absolutely. you know, like what's going to happen yeah. when you get a few b beers and some really <laughs> bad singers or, or Mario Kart, you know, just the zany over the top physics. Mario Party, you know, self-explanatory, 
Um, it's just, I, I think that, 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 that that's also just kind of l letting itself to the party title, right? Trying to create a party mm -hmm. within the game and keeping it fun, keeping it light. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, moving up the list, number 13 is a game that brought the player community into the future of the game and de design and experience. So what immediately comes to your mind here, Joe, as a, as a game that really brought the developers closer to their fans? Uh, you know, the, the the first one that comes to mind is Minecraft. Absolutely. I mean, the, I mean, the, 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 there, there's a game that uh, was built uh, on a on a very simple foundation. T took the, basically the idea of Lego, and brought it into a game, and, and made it just so. That, I mean, you can just the user creation. I mean, is just off the chart with that game. That is a true sandbox. You know, yes. I, I, I Grand Theft Auto Three created the sandbox, but this really is the core of what a sandbox is. Like I watch my nephew and his buddies play this game religiously and they're among millions of kids. And, and once they're kind of satisfied with the creation elements of just building something and destroying it, they create games for themselves. And this really came about, and I followed this, so I'm gonna get my brownie points here. I think it was the, <laughs> um, the Red Rock, or oh, now I'm getting it wrong already. Red Rock or Red Lava update or something like that. There was some major update mm -hmm. that came about where you could use like on off switches and make things happen. So now what my yeah. nephew is doing is he's kind of learning video game programming now. He, he'll he hit a switch, he'll show me, he'll set up this whole playing field. I hit a switch over here. This starts the cart that takes you over to the pig steak chopping factory, which then <laughs> launches it a, a flappy bird into the air. Like he, he actually made Flappy Bird inside of Minecraft using programming, awesome. light programming and switches. It, it, it's really getting kids to really use their imagination, especially in an age when with the boomers and the Xers are constantly saying, oh, these millennials, they don't know how to think. They don't have any you know, creativity or imagination. I mean, look at any kid playing Minecraft. You just, it boggles your mind, the creativity yeah, there. It, it, yeah, and uh, it's uh, you know, and uh, Terraria and a little big planner also uh, really good examples of this. But uh, I mean, Minecraft, I mean, just really, really stands out in this category. And like you said, uh, just uh, like you said, that this idea that uh, that some of these kids don't really know how to create. I mean, you just have to go on Minecraft once, and you can see that that's not the case. I mean, uh, there, there, it's there, there's some really, really cool stuff happening on that right now. And Minecraft's really like this example yeah. of this new phenomenon in gaming, which I'm actually okay with. It's it's the game and it's it's the uh, in development game, you know, that mm -hmm. is never really finished. It's constantly in like alpha or pre-alpha, if you want to call it that. Minecraft isn't really a finished game. It's just, it just evolves over time. Same with Terraria. Terraria is a completely different game than when it when it yeah. first started. Project mm -hmm. Cyber is in that vein. Uh, this yeah. isn't a you know this isn't anything new, but I think it's become a really great way for developers to get a riskier idea out there. Get the bare bones concept like they're doing with Project Cyber, and through user feedback, build that into something perfect that your community just is is completely invested in. Going to what you're always talking about, Joe. Stop telling us what we want. We want ask us what we want as gamers, and that's what I think the Minecraft Ooh. formula has really done right. And that's Star Citizen's big. gonna be doing that too. And it, and it's gonna just create a really long lasting uh, kind of a thing. I mean, I mean, like especially Minecraft. I, I could see this game still being really in the next, even I think in the next five, maybe even ten years. This is a game that's gonna have some staying power. It's, it's gonna, gonna be evolve for a long time. It's gonna evolve. I can already see Absolutely. it. Like you know, EverQuest next coming out for PC, maybe PS4 is already kind of lit lighting for in my opinion from what i've seen of everquest next it's lighting a fire under notch's ass that now the fact that you can actually sculpt your blocks in everquest and mm -hmm. create spheres and little intricate designs versus just the the standard block building of minecraft i can see minecraft evolving over time you know adding Absolutely. more types of game modes and more types of construction capabilities it's just something that yeah and even destiny by Bungie is kind of being pitched as this kind of 10 year idea that it's not, we're not just gonna throw this out and start working on a sequel. We're just gonna keep supporting this game and evolving over time. I like this. 
I wish I, that EA Sports could do this. <laughs> you know, I, 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 was, I, I was just gonna say because we mentioned this before that a lot of these games fall into this yearly uh, trap of uh, yes. having to put a new game out. Yes. I, I, th I think especially the Minecraft model is an excellent one, one to follow. And, and this, it's uh, especially when it comes to risk as a developer. I mean, there's very, very little kind of minimal risk, and you can actually. And up with something really cool. You know, again, my, my Minecraft is, uh, you know, something that uh, I think a lot of new developers, you know, take a look at, the, at that model that they're using it and uh, you know, think about it. Well, think about Chris Roberts with Star Citizen. I mean, that's an ambitious oh project, Joe. Oh, but to say, okay, I'm going to put this out with a few planets here and there, and and over maybe a five-year span, there will be like hundreds of galaxies. But that that takes time. But that, that's good. It, it builds organically, and the community grows with it. And I think that's a, again, like if you have a really Especially when you have a risky concept in the in this cautionary age and age, that I think that's a better way of going than free to play. You know, I think just kind of keep it in, in in beta for a while. Like you know, it, it, it's it's not that big of a deal. Like look how long these MMOs and MOBAs stay in beta, and they have these fantastic communities, and you never really hear about them coming out of beta because they're already doing so well and they're just evolving over time. Um, so yeah, I mean that's 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 a really that's again something that makes it legendary. Something that really brings the user in and so that they feel satisfied. Moving on to number 12 on our list, let's talk about games that actually push the boundaries. So we're talking about pushing the boundaries of free speech, alternative ideas, uh, gender, and bending gender, and even political ideas that aren't the most popular. So let's talk about uh, games, like there are a lot of games that do this, Joe, but there are certain games that are also legendary and have cha and po arguably changed the world. Yeah, the the, the, the first game that, that I'm going to mention, uh, this one stands out right away to me, is, is Tomb Raider. Uh, the, nice. Here's, here's, a ga here's a game that that, that, uh, that, that took the, the action game and put a female in the lead role. A kick-ass female. I mean, I mean uh, I, you talk to you talk to any gamer. I, I, I think uh, if you have any kind of conversation, I, I think Tomb Raider is always bound to come up. You know, I mean, it's, it works on so many levels. I mean, obviously, the first one is I mean, she's an attractive female kicking ass, right? It, it, it's but it, it what, I, what I really liked about it is it, it didn't uh, portray her as like a, the uh, damsel in distress. You know, she was somebody who could handle herself and was out there kicking butt, right? Exactly, because up until that point. You're right, Joe, really, females in games, with the small exception of Samus and Metroid. I'm gonna say small, and I'm gonna tell you why in a second, why that's small, okay? Really, it was the Princess Peaches and, and those types of characters that had to be rescued. I wanna talk about Samus for a sec. Yes, she technically was the first major female char action character in a game, but we didn't see that till the end of the game, Joe. She ran around with yep. a mask the whole time. We thought she was a guy, okay? Mm -hmm. Tomb Raider right in your face. Like, like, and it's funny too, because you remember being a kid and also talking to little boys who play games. It's like, oh, I don't wanna play as a girl. Ew, where's the guy character? I don't wanna play as a girl, <laughs> so they don't wanna play as, as Tomb Raider. I'm like, you realize how kick-ass this character is? But it, it, it's, it's yep. and that was something that was big, you know? Like, you know, Tomb Raider had major hoops to go over in terms of, you know, it, it was a great game, but in terms of being accepted as something bigger than it was, really, Joe, most people wanted to play for the TNA back then. They wanted to see oh, Lara jiggle. I don't <laughs> think anybody even cared about the fact that it was a DC. And, you know, it wasn't the greatest game. Actually, Tomb Raider 2 really was where the game mechanics started to get polished. But, yeah. you know, but now... Look at look at the reboot of Tomb Raider, one of the biggest games of the seventh generation. Yeah. No question that you're even like playing as a female heroine. Everybody played that game. There's no, it's not even it's not even a question. What's uh, the next game that really stands out for you there, Mike? In terms of pushing the envelope of speech and ideas, I'm gonna say let, let's go with let's go with Leisure Suit Larry. There you go. Let's talk about probably the only true adult game. In gaming history, uh, it took so long for that game to come to consoles. That was that was a controversy back in the '80s, Joe. When when that came out, Leisure Suit Larry, the first one in the land of the loud leisures. What what do you remember about that? that the the climate around that game. I mean, it, it was just it was such a bold. I mean, to, to introduce uh, sexual themes into Blatant a game. Sexual uh, themes. Yeah, and and just to, to be very unapologetic, just to. to I mean, it, it just it didn't pull any punches when it came to that. I mean, you just you had a nerdy guy. The, the idea was you were this nerdy kind of a preppy kind of guy trying to get lead. 
<laughs> pure and simple. That's that's essentially what that game was about. And like and, wa- and, wa- and, wa- and wa- just watching them uh, like make these moves on these on these women and just you know seeing them fail. It's like you know it's <laughs> it was it, it was funny. It was very edgy for its time. It was very edgy, and we we haven't really seen. Like we've seen things that, that get close, but not like having it in your face like that. Sex is always going to yeah. be something that's very, very dicey with gaming. I mean, we, we see it pop up here and there. You know, obviously The Witcher has a bit of sexual content. I haven't played it, but I, I think back to God of War 1 and 2 and 3. You know, the off-camera sex scenes and, you know, the moans and groans. You know, uh, you know we, we talked about this on another podcast, Joy. <sighs> Why don't we go back to idle only games? So, like, why is Leisure Suit Larry just so stuck in history? You know, even though it tries to make comebacks on the on the platforms and the consoles, it really seems like the adult only gaming seems to kind of start and end end with that series in the eighties and nineties. Well, the thing with that is, is it came right around around that time when, when censorship was still kind of new, and I, I think it came out at the right time that it was able to get away with the, the stuff that 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 it got away with then. You know, when, when it comes to a, a game getting an, an adult-only rating, like we've talked about this before with in censorship, I mean, if you really, you know, to be honest, like I'm, I'm kind of shocked that actually South Park didn't end up getting this kind of rating. But I mean, to, to put out a game that has an adult-only rating will, will, I wouldn't say spell death for your game, but it, it'll make it very hard for you to actually get your game out there and get an audience for it because they're, to, with the exception of maybe a porn shop, they're not going to be able to sell it. So, you know, Laser Shoot Larry just came out at the right time. I think that, that that's a big thing with that. Why, Joe? Okay, so I'm going to ask you why, Joe. Okay, why is a game about a loser in Vegas chasing after, like, who's 40 years old, sexual references, cheap sexual humor? Why is this game legendary? Why is this... Why is this on, like, major lists? Like, what, what makes this game legendary, Joe? Like, what... A game, yes, that pushed the boundaries, but somehow did it well. It just uh, with the 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 humor, like it, it was just you know it was. Uh, how can I explain this uh, the best way? What did you think of the character? Did you did you root for the character, Joe? I, I, I sort of, but, but I mean, it, it was still fun to, to watch him. Like I, I was, you're still kind of pulling for him, but I mean, you just you know, like as soon as you see, you see him try and do these things, you just you know he's gonna fail, right? But it was still it was funny to watch these kind of moments unfold. You know, that was that, that was the thing. You know what it did yeah. for me? Like, I was really young when I played them, and I shouldn't have, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, it really demystified sex for me. Like, at a young age, yeah. it really just took it out of that dirty category and just made it funny and human. Yep. You know, it, it, yep. it showed sex in a way that ha- that wasn't shown in the movies, where it was like, you know, these stupid, misty, you know, scenes with saxophone playing in the background and... You know, fake orgasms. So this was like real, like losers of life getting down and, and failing and falling yeah. on their face, but still finding a way to fuck at the end of the night. And, and I think that's, <laughs> I think it's honesty and humanity is yeah. what elevated it above just being a, a, a soft core porn game. Because so, I think a lot of, you know, and I think movies are particularly guilty of this, you know, where you have that traditional, you know, boy meets girl, you know, boy and girl have a fight for a little bit, and then boy marries girl, right? It's uh you know that this just uh, it just uh, like you said just kind of uh, I don't know if making it seem more like reality is the right way to say it but it, I mean just it it because uh, you can't say that it looks real because I mean it was very cartoony kind of looking but I, it uh, just you know there was something that felt real yeah you know it, and it, I think yeah. it just came down to the fact that it was a point and click adventure and it was story based. And yeah. because there was just, there was not only action, but so much reading that you really got into his head. Like yeah. you really, it really, like he felt like a fully fleshed out character, even though he was funny. He had, yeah. like, you, I can describe Larry to you. Like he seems like a very real character, like somebody I would actually know. You know, and I think mm-hmm. that's what really elevated it. It's, it's not just, it's, it's, it's fine to go for titillation. And that's what, in a modern context, South Park does so well. I'm glad you mentioned that, because really... With what South Park, the stick of truth, was able to get away with, there's no reason why we can't even see more adult or any games coming out, for better or for worse. I mean, you already saw glimpses of that with Catherine, a very adult yes. love story, you know. Um, but, I mean, who knows? You know, I, I really don't, I don't ever see mainstream games, game change, chains packing adult-only games, but really, that whole idea is going out the window anyway, so... 
you know, I, 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 I'm wondering if maybe we'll start seeing like an adults only section on Steam. Do you ever think that'll happen, Joe? Uh, I, I think it, it, it definitely could could happen. You know, it, it's just a matter of what uh, you know to allow that to happen. I mean, do you want to see uh, it happen? <laughs> I let's talk, no, let's talk happen. really. I'm not like let's really. Do you think this would benefit the industry if we had it, an adults only it, subsection? It, it, could ben- it could benefit if if it's done properly. I mean, if it just becomes inundated with kind of stupid, you know, like porn kind of simulators, that then it, then it could harm harm things. It would have to be done, but it would have to be to make sure to not get carried away with it because then. You know, I mean, you know, you know, who knows what could happen? You know, and what, touching on South Park, you know, and this always kind of when I watched uh, the documentary Six Days to Air, you know, they were talking about uh, you know stuff and they they do stuff, and then the person that maybe hasn't seen South Park goes, oh, I, I found that kind of too edgy and offensive, and, and I think anybody who's a fan would just to say to them, you know, that's just South Park. You know, they they've always been about that from pretty well day one. And it, it's uh, you know, it's maybe part of the reason why they kind of get away with some of the stuff that they do. But I mean, it's just like I said before, when it comes to, to the humor of that in particular, it, it's yes, borderline edgy and offensive sometimes. But it, it's just clever, well timed humor, and that really carried over into that game as well. Yeah, you know, South Park's Sick of Truth is is really, in my opinion, like people like already. I was listening to IGN the other day, and uh, Greg and Colin are all, already have it on their short list for Game of the Year. I, I don't mm-hmm. disagree with them. This has been a shitty year <laughs> overall, and I'd say mm-hmm. South Park is looking really great. Not to put down South Park, I'm just saying. I, I wouldn't have expected to say that South Park might be my game of the year, but looking at the shitty competition out there, it might just end up being. But here's the thing. It, it, it's saying things that people always wanted to hear, but it had to take a behemoth, like an untu- virtually untouchable behemoth like South Park to really do it. You couldn't... There, there would be, like, you know, if, if we ever see Leisure Suit Larry come to PS4, Xbox One, it's going to be because of games like South Park really busting the doors open, like I said, for better or for worse, of what we're allowed to see in an M-rated game that will yeah, actually yeah. be sold at Walmart. And then just games being able to kind of, you know, really put, like we're saying in here, pushing the limits of free speech, uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, that, that the the censorship, you know, kind of held that back for a long time, so it's really nice to see like, a game like this really, you know, push that and, and to be able to actually succeed and get it out there, and I want to see more of that, because it, it, cause, uh, it, you know, our, our society, uh, let's be honest, you know, it's, it's pretty censored, and, and, you know, they like to, to kind of hold us down, so it's nice to see something like this actually get out and, and, and then not have messed around with it too much. Yeah, and you know what, for, you know, and you also see that kind of in, in terms of depicting sexuality, you know, I'd say games like Mass Effect 3 were mm-hmm. a watershed moment for portrayals uh, of like lesbians, gays, bisexuals, mm-hmm. transgenders in games. Um, it caused a bit of controversy, but it was, it was handled respectfully. And, and now you've got Last of Us Left Behind DLC where it's basically suggested, spoiler alert, that Ellie, and ha- Ellie had a lesbian relationship. Um, mm-hmm. You have that, but then you also have Capcom blatantly announcing that one of our main characters is going to be gay in Resident Evil 7. Yeah. I already see two sides to this show. What do you think? Because this is really the new thing in terms of free speech and pushing alternative ideas. The idea of representing um, different different sexual preferences. What, what do you think about where it's going based on what you're seeing and maybe where it should be going? Or I don't know. See, now, see, I wasn't aware of that, uh, like you said, with Capcom and them possibly introducing like some kind of uh, gay or lesbian character. And, and I, I think that this kind of... Uh, mirrors kind of what's happening in society a little bit you know we've seen a lot of uh you know this is be kind of edgy for me to say but people almost kind of coming out as kind of like a hip kind of a thing to do and i don't want to i i personally don't really want to see us carry over into games because uh let's be honest on some games kind of let's see what other games are doing and they go oh that's kind of cool let's do that i don't i don't want to see like a bunch of these games kind of hop on that bandwagon too much because then it just dilutes the whole idea right right it becomes about sex where it doesn't have to be now and that's why i, I really want to contrast those for you the last of us versus resident evil see in the last of us i haven't played the dlc but i've seen previews i've read up on it and stuff so i, I, I have a pretty good handle it's really about the relationship between these two girls and, and especially in in, in uh, a crisis situation 
you can start exploring sexuality within that. That makes sense, okay? Like, you know, sex is part of Crisis. But in Resident Evil? A survival yeah. horror game? Do we need to know about who the guy fucks in his bedroom? This is my problem. Again, and yeah, whatever, I'll maybe get labeled as homophobe. I'm not homophobe. I'm just saying that there's a time and place, heterosexual or homosexuality, for the depictment of sex. You know, sex in anything, whether it's games or movies or TV, can slow a plot down. And, I, and I'm sick of it having to be shoehorned into everything we see, whether it's gay sex, whether it's heterosexual sex, it's always about the sexuality of the character, even if it's not a romantic movie. It's just like, okay, we have to put it out there that the character's gay or that they're not gay. You know, who cares? The movie wasn't even about sex, but now we have to make it about sex. And this is what I'm worried about, that it's, it's not going to create um, dialogue between people. It's going to further divide them because it's like I don't play Resident Evil to know who everybody fucks I play it to get yeah. the shit scared out of me see whereas we take it like in The Last of Us you know what they did with that uh, that DLC it, it actually w w when you look at it in the context of, of, of uh, the full on game it, it, it makes sense and it adds to the story it, 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 it's uh, you can connect the dots a little bit and it right. actually it, it makes sense but, but but like you said to just kind of attack it on is like a not like a feature but, but, but just as a Kind of a, it's hipsterish. Yeah, exactly. Right, and, and I, 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 you know, I fear that that some of this may happen. I just hope it doesn't come to become too prevalent. This know, isn't surprising on Capcom's part, Joe. They're just making terrifyingly bad decisions across the board. They're in panic yeah. mode now, and I think what they're doing is they're just trying to go for the easy dollar now. Just let's pick an issue that's hot right now. Oh, it's gay rights. Okay, let's 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 let's, let's tack that onto our game and and make it a bigger thing just to make up for the fact that. We've completely lost sight of that franchise, and it's not even near what it used to be. So, well, let's let, let's hope they they don't go down that path too much. Uh, they they got to go back to what they, they what they do and just make good games again. Don't worry about that other stuff. Just create fun games. Yeah, guys. pick your battles, people. There's nothing wrong with being yeah. political or expressing alternative ideas. Hell, make a game about Satanism yeah. if that's what you drives you. Make a game about make Catherine two about two lesbians. I don't care if it's a great game. Play it, whatever. But. Don't tack it. Don't don't put it in our faces if it doesn't need to be there. And that same goes for exactly. anything. You know, get out of this Hollywood formula that there has to be a sex scene, that there has to be a romance where there doesn't necessarily have to be one. Let's just let's just get over that. That's just horny old white man running Hollywood bullshit. Let's move on for this topic. We have spent a lot of time on number twelve, but very. I think we could always do a roundtable on this again. Number eleven on our list of. Uh, we'll take a break after number ten. Number eleven on the list of traits that make games truly legendary and last for the test of time games that prove number 11 games that prove that video games can be educational teaching tools and real life sims yep there's a uh, for for me the, the the two that uh, the two early standouts are definitely sim city and the carmen san diego games now uh, the, the car first of all the the uh, carmen san diego games are games that i personally got to play back in the early days and uh you know kind of loosely kind of based on the the, the tv show and whatnot but it was just it was a very educational you learned a little bit about the globe about the world in certain places and then you know the game like sim city i mean it's just it's uh you know it, it just it, it uh it, it was such a cool concept back in the day that you could build your own city and just kind of you know tinker you almost felt like kind of like a god you know kind of you know, cr creating your own city and, and kind of messing with people a little bit, and, and you know, it, it was uh, that kind of stuff was uh, was uh, Sim City. It was was really cool for that. Well, yeah, especially when you're a kid, like back in the day, playing Sim City on PC. Like yeah. you know, even though it's a you know, it's it's still a video game. You know, I'd say it's more advanced now, but you know, it taught you a little bit of something about zoning. You know, it taught you a yeah. little bit of something about taxation and where you know where to wh why cities are built the way they are. You know, and, and it's like, you know, then you take the SimCity reboot, love it or hate it. You know, I showed that to my brother who's an urban planner, and he's like, wow, this is really speaking my language. You know, it's, it's really gotten deep. You know, this can almost, like, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say teach you how to become an urban planner, but, you know, at least get you in that mind frame to want to learn more, you know, because it just does it so well. Mm -hmm. um, for me, like, let's talk about Carmen San Diego. So, okay, yeah, it, it hasn't been around for a while for maybe our younger listeners who don't understand what Carmen Sandiego was. 
tell us what it was about, Joe, but also why an educational game could be fun. What made it fun? And what was it about? It, it just, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's a, uh, it's been a long time since, since I played this. I, I, it's, um, the, the, the plot of it's kind of escaping me a little bit, but it just, it, uh, it was just a very fun, simple game that, that, that just taught you about, uh, and, and had some puzzle and clue finding and that kind of stuff. It was, it was, uh, it was, it was a nice mix of the educational and the fun. So what would happen is you're on the trail of Carmen San Diego, and yeah. you basically have to suss out her henchmen all over the world, or in time, or whatever sequel you're playing. There was in the world, there was where in the USA, where in time is Carmen San Diego. But I'm thinking about where in the world. What would happen is so you would drop in on like a major capital city, and you'd have to go search. Yeah. Say you go to Greece, you have to go search the Parthenon. Then you have to go, and you'd learn a little bit about the Parthenon while you're there. But then you'd also get a clue as to where Carmen Sandio's, San Diego's whereabouts were, and maybe she would have an item that was related to the country she was in. So you'd learn about their culture a bit too, and and, and it forced you, and it imposed this narrative structure over kind of like a geography and culture lesson. And that's the thing. It's like. You know, it's, it's different from, say, you know, in school when they have those, you know, educational software, like where it teaches you how to count on a video screen. Like, this this took it above that and added a story to it. Mm -hmm. But in turn, like, okay, we, we've talked about this before, Joe. Like, do you really think games can teach you about real real world stuff? There are some. Uh, I think a good, a good example that uh, actually we have down here, uh, you know, and uh, when it comes to, to music, you know, rock, rock band kind of started this uh, music kind of thing. But but I, th I, th I think the one that that's uh, I think more important is uh, the Rocksmith game, and that's because it actually tell you how to actually play a real guitar. You know, rock, rock band and guitar here, they, they were cool and they were fun for for what they were, but Rocksmith actually taught you how to play a real instrument. Which is extremely cool, and it does it in a very, inform very, very educational and very fun at the same time. Yeah, Rocksmith really addressed uh, a lot of the concern that were levied against, uh, you know, Guitar Hero and Rock Band One and Two. I w I'm going to argue against Rock Band Three. Rock Band Three actually technically did teach you how to play guitar. It's just that it wasn't marketed very well and nobody bought it. Um, mm -hmm. Which is why I think that Harmonix is hinting that they may be rebooting Rock Band for 8th generation, which I think would be awesome, because I think they've mm -hmm. seen that that the rhythm genre didn't die like everybody said it did. No fucking way, man. I'm still part of the rock band community, man. I'm on those scoreboards. There's a die-hard community that's that oh, still absolutely. downloads songs to this day, you know, and you know, or or look at the the hype around Dance Central, you know, or Just Dance. Rhythm games are far from gone. I think they were just gestating, and I think Rocksmith really was the right thing to, to to spark that interest again. The fact that you could just take your own guitar and plug it into it, and and literally learn how to play real songs that that's mind blowing. Yeah, it really is. Yep. And, and it addressed all the critics of like you know guitar heroes saying, oh, you're not pl you're just playing plastic instruments. Well, you know, kind of. And it just. It kind of satisfied, uh, you know, for people that uh, I wish I would have kind of actually gone into to Rocksmith, because I mean, this, this kind of satisfies your fanboyism where you take like like a Nirvana song and you can actually learn how to play your favorite Nirvana song. You know, it's just it's, you know, to to actually be able to do that in a game and to actually have fun doing. It, I mean, that, that, that's the the coolness factor is off the chart there. Now, if you're yeah. listening to us and you're an uh, actual guitar teacher, I hope you're not, you know, slitting your wrists right now. The, you know, <laughs> there's still need for a real human being to teach you. Yeah. But for those of you who are maybe more antisocial or lazy, <laughs> you, can, you can learn a thing or yeah. two. Uh, let's let's stick on this, this educational teaching tools in real life sims. Let's talk about sports and racing. Okay. Let's talk about games that really bridge that gap. What were some of those games that really stand, like that are legendary, that really, you know, brought us closer to like being on that gridiron or on that mound or, or, or even just not even knowing how to play the sport or race the car, but at least knowing more about the culture and the mechanics yeah. of it. Yeah, you know, for for uh, for uh, when it comes to racing games, which uh, I'm particularly fond of, you know, games like uh, Gran Turismo and uh, you know some of the Need for Speed games, you know, it, it's a uh, you know, these games. It's always kind of been a toss up between realism and and arcadey, and there's been some that, that that have reached that nice kind of happy medium to where it's fun but still feels realistic. You know, the, 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 there's some of those like uh, Gran Turismo was actually pretty good at this, with the exception of the wonky crash physics but yeah. uh, but 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 actually taught you 
you know, the proper way to race around a racetrack. It's just not a matter of just turning into the corners and whatnot. There's an actual way to to actually do this so you don't lose speed in the corners and so that you can, like, uh, let's talk about that. Like, if, if you, when it comes to uh, to racing, like, if, if you nail, like, if you, if, say, if you, you take a corner the wrong way, you know, it, it's just, it's, it, the problem kind of compounds as you go on. If you mess up just kind of once, you know, that'll make you slower for the next corner and the next one. You know, so it actually requires some skill and there's actually a little bit of kind of math involved, you know, to, to actually race properly. It's not just something where you could, it's not like just driving down the street where you're just gas and go and turn. You know, there, there's actually some skill involved. Hey, and, man, uh, I mean, so the fact that you've got world champion Gran Turismo yeah. players becoming real racers in real life says something and that goes back yep. to the first Gran Turismo on PS1 I remember how mind-blowing that was to, mm-hmm. to read a manual and say and, and, and what the hell is drafting like you know, <laughs> like and, and learning how to draft like that was something mind-blowing that no game had really done well, yet you know uh, taking uh, uh, advantage of wind resistance and physics just mm-hmm. incredible you know it's funny that you mentioned Need for Speed and I know some people will be like oh that's an arcade game what are you talking about but Need for Speed has really gotten the street racing culture down pat, okay? In yep, terms of absolutely. customization, in terms of mm-hmm. like real cars and just get and, and like what they're and, and how they feel to drive and, and teaching you about like how your car works and where it can yep. go. There was no better game than for me than the original Need for Speed Underground and some of the more yeah. recent games like Most Wanted. And there was uh, the one, uh, I think I mentioned this before, the one, uh, it was, uh, I believe it was the first uh, Need for Speed Shift, mm-hmm. that uh, when they actually went inside the car, it, it really nailed uh, that, 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 that feeling, because you could actually, it actually sounded like you actually had a helmet on, and you were behind the wheel, because you could hear, like, everything was kind of muted, and you could feel the wind blowing across, it, it just, it, it, it actually really nailed that feel of actually being in the cockpit. You know, it wasn't just like a, it was not like the same sound like in the, the camera view where you're looking kind of like a third person. You know, some games kind of sound the same no matter which way you're playing it. Yep. But in that game in particular, actually, when you went into that mode, you actually had that ambiance and that kind of feeling of actually, you know, I got a helmet on and I'm racing. You know, Joe, it's funny you mentioned Shift like, and, and talking about the, the mechanics of inside the car, which are largely mm-hmm. ignored, but which are kind of coming to the forefront now. The same guys who are making Shift are also making the upcoming Project Cars which is coming mm-hmm. out for next gen this fall it just got revealed and this is one of the most realistic looking racers i've ever seen but again really getting into yep. like what the car looks on the on the inside like what um uh evolution's doing with drive club for the ps4 really yep. like just taking it uh, like yeah we've seen the roads we've seen the sunlight glinting off the car now let's see the guts of the car let's feel like you're actually inside that cockpit and this game project cars is actually going to work with uh project morpheus it's an official Morpheus title, so we're we're getting closer there. Before we leave this this topic about um, real life sims, educational teaching tools, let's talk about sports games just to kind of finish this off mm-hmm. uh, for topic eleven. Let's talk about how why, yeah, EA Sports. You know, obviously they're kind of accepted now, maybe not as big as they used to be, but why did they become big, Joe? What was it about Madden? What was it about NHL hockey? What was it about FIFA that were game changers? That that, well, that that made them stand the test of time and became the coveted go-to sports franchises. You no, know, they really, uh, you know, especially graphically wise. I mean, we got got to the point where you know I really see this recently. But he, but even going a little bit further back, it actually looked and felt like the real sport. You know, like some of the early uh, sports games, you know, they, they were fun, but it didn't quite kind of nail that feeling. And even with some of the Madden games, like you get right into actually designing and, and laying out plays. And you can actually, you know, that, that can actually teach you, you know, the proper ways to actually execute and actually lay out a, a game plan. Right? Yeah. And, and, yeah, you're right. You know, it, it was bringing like the real life strategy into it, like the, yeah. the playbook, but also the AI. Like really, mm-hmm. really focusing on making it like a realistic experience, not like you know Tecmo Bowl or NES play action football, where every yeah. line offensive bend like would like move in the same direction towards the target. You know, you had individual free thinking sprites, uh, and, and that's re- really elevated. Like you know, it's just 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 kind of taking itself seriously. Like EA Sports really wanted to, to to cater to like the hardcore sports fan. They didn't care about having mass appeal by the 90s. I think that's where, I think that was like the turning point 
where like Madden, when it first came out for PC, seemed like any something everybody would play. But as mm -hmm. it got went through the years, it just seemed to to be more alienating and divisive. Where I think your average sports fan, whether it was Madden or FIFA, would, it all of a sudden was kind of alienated by. It. Did, did you, I kind of sense that. Yeah, a, a little bit, you know, and uh, you know they they could have uh, you know copped out and went from really kind of an arcadey kind of feel, but you know that would take taken away from the experience because uh, these games are all about the, the realism of the sport, right? And uh, that, that's the reason why I play them. Like, you know, let's look, uh, yeah. Especially the, the, the NHL, I mean, uh, uh, for the EA Sports games, that's always the one that stands out for me. And, uh, you know, and especially recently, I mean, when you look and play it, and it's just uh, the, the feel, it, it just, it, it feels like, it just, it feels hot. Like, sports done the, the proper way, you know. The EA has done some more kind of arcadey kind of sports games. And uh, to, to maybe appeal to that more of a casual sports gamer. But, uh... uh you know, it's uh, it's still got to be about with these. It's it's got to feel realistic and it's got to be somewhat of a simulation, right? Otherwise, it, it just it feels kind of off. Yeah, just it's just really yeah. trying to stay away from gimmicks, stuff that's outside the sport, and really just trying to yeah. perfect that virtual experience year to year. I love or hate them for it. I mean, that seems what they're committed to doing. Like, look at angel hockey. It's like incremental changes every year, but every year it just gets deeper and deeper with with it really what culminated in NHL 14 with with the the improved defensive physics um, and they've basically just created their own their, their own demographic to that so that's really it really like it's you know that's 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 what makes them legendary I think it's just that because they're so close to the culture they just get everything right and, and it's it's made by people who that truly respect the sport like these people make nothing but sports games like this is their life their passion Absolutely. Let's uh, go to number 10 on this list of uh, the traits that make a tr game truly legendary. How about a game that turned the idea of video gaming into an actual sport? Wow. And uh, for me, like instantly, the uh, probably two of my favorite fighting games are probably the, some of the best examples. And that's, you know, all the Street Fighter games are pretty cool. But I mean, Street Fighter 2 and uh, the original Mortal Kombat games. I mean, like even in the arcades and in the consoles, they're, 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 those were games that that just it just it encouraged it just it's it was just head on competition. Okay, so let's talk about Street Fighter 2. So you remember Street yes. Fighter 2 back in '92, '93. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there have been other fighting games, Joe. What, what was about Street Fighter Two that resonated, Joe? Let's let's think back to being 12, 13 oh, years old man. here. What really drove the whole schoolyard around this game? You know, what, what, it, what it did what it did do right? It it uh, it, it, uh, it just it, it controlled well. I mean, that the characters were were cool looking. I mean, it, it, it's uh, it was. Uh, it, it was it was accessible at the same time, but it would also, you know, deep. In, the, 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 the deep so that the person that really kind of devoted the time to it could get really good, and uh, you know, it, it just said, uh, damn it, those games were so much fun to play. I mean, and in Mortal Kombat, I mean, it really stood out for me. I mean, I played that both in the arcade on in the consoles, and uh, in some of these games, the Mortal Kombat especially did kind of push the, the the boundaries a little bit too, but uh, I mean, damn it, you know, those were games that were both kind of accessible but uh, if you wanted to get really hardcore into it you could and get really 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 good at these games. I think you, you mentioned a key point there. It's the idea of layering difficulty levels and experiences within one package. Yeah. You can play it so many different ways. Like you said Joe if, you, if you're not big at fighting games you can get in there, mash a few buttons make a Hadouken go off by accident and maybe even win mm -hmm. a ra maybe win a round you know if, if you mm -hmm. happen to dive kick enough um, then that's usually <laughs> the way to do it. Or but then if you're the hardcore Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat or anything yeah. kind of player and you study frames and you study and you study intricacies of like you know the combos, you know the counters, you know all the deep stuff. You can really go as deep as you want with those games. I'd say more to an extent with Street Fighter Two than Mortal back in the day. Mortals yeah. caught up, but um, really I Street mean, Fighter set uh, that standard. And with some of these fightings, I mean, literally, like some the guys that have got really good. Some of these gamers have made actually. I don't know, an actual career out of actually mastering these games. Now, that's the amazing thing. Some of these guys are professional gamers. Well, and if anybody asks why these people can make a career out of playing a video game, it's because, like we're saying, these games are so complex, yeah. yet so simple, there's so many strategies that you could put into something like Injustice, 
or Street mm -hmm. Fighter or even Smash Brothers, man, like which is now yep. an Evo certified game, I think at least. You know, these it, it, like any sport. I mean, there, there's. It, it really depends on how how you play, and that could be a multitude of different ways. And that's what really, I think, made those games stand out uh, from mm -hmm. other games. I mean, they've been imitated, but it's not only just mechanics, Joe. Like, there's really something about Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat that makes icon makes them iconic. And you mentioned characters. You know, that yes. plays a lot into it. Like, what? Why? Like, why not Killer Instinct? Why not? Eternal Champions? Why not Soul Calibur? Why is it Street Fighter Immortal at the top? What is it about those games that just makes them so much more iconic to you, Joe? Like, what do you feel like when you see Street Fighter versus Tekken or Soul Calibur? I think it had a lot to do with uh, mainly the the characters and the way they were designed. You know, they it uh, they just they had cool moves. And and, the, and, uh, and names they just they had catchy names. You know, like they Ryan felt like Cannon. fleshed out characters. Sub Zero, Scorpion. I mean, I mean, when, when you think fighting games, I mean, those are names that just pop in your head right away if you're if you're a fighting game fan, right? They said they were cool characters. They did awesome stuff. You know, like Scorpion with that, uh, you know, with uh, with that uh, spear thing, and Sub Zero freezing, and. Uh, you know, just and uh, oh man, and, and just uh, the the saying like the 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 uh, Hadouken and stuff like that in Street Fighter. I mean, it's just those, those iconic phrases and characters. I mean, just pop in your head, right? You know, and I think it's daring to be different and just thinking outside yes. the box in terms of the character design themselves. Like there was always that famous um, piece of art, like abstract art where they have like three colored blocks in different sizes and shapes. There's like eight of yep. them, and as soon as you know, you're like, oh, those are the Street Fighter characters, even though they're like abstract yep. colored blocks because of that vivid color and the over-the-top yeah. nature of their personas. They weren't cliches, you know? They weren't yeah. like like your at, like generic action heroes or dull, mm -hmm. vampy, ba like busty babes. Like we had Dalsim with like extendable arms and and, <laughs> and M. Bison, the neo-Nazi, and you know, just, 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 yeah. just iconic stuff. And that's what it really is. It's, it's fusing game mechanics with just, just thinking outside the box in, ter in terms of like creating new archetypes and design, so we're talking about sports games. I mean, there are other there are other games that are mm -hmm. are competitive too. You know, why? Like, I don't, like let's talk, let's talk about uh, Call of Duty. I mean, the, there's uh, when the, the multiplayer in Call of Duty. I mean, that, that just immediately, like the multiplayer community, I mean, that just immediately became a competitive thing. I, I mean, and these people are. Uh, I've attempted to get into this a little bit, you know, with not so much success. I mean, the, here's a game that if you devote some time to and, and you get part of this community, it is ultra competitive. Why this game, though, Joe? Why did Call of Duty beat out Battlefield? Why did it beat out Killzone? Why did it beat... Like, and I'm just talking about, like, grand scale popularity. It, no other game has touched Call of Duty in terms of just accessibility. What is it about Call of Duty that, that, that just did it better than any other game? I think uh, just the, uh, the the controls were were, were solid. Uh, a really good variety of maps. Uh, just getting into the lobbies and stuff were really were laid out in a pretty simple and accessible way. It just it, it, it made it uh, not too hard to to get into. And uh, I mean, it was just a uh, uh, it, it just said they, they took that formula. And they just seemed like they I, I would say pretty well perfected it. You know, and just made it not. Uh, they, they they could have really made it over complicated. I think if they wanted to, but I think the way that they, they they designed it just made it very accessible. It was it was arcadey enough to be realistic. You know, it wasn't yeah. Quake and it wasn't Battlefield. It was somewhere in between. You know, where it was fast, yeah. but it was accurate. And, and you know, and I don't I don't know if that's going to stand the time as much, Joe, because I think a large part of what made Call of Duty amazing in the 7th gen was the fact that it was pretty much the only shooter on consoles that ran at 60 frames a second and that played a huge role in gameplay i i, I you know I, you know maps are maps graphics are graphics but really like in terms of just fluid mechanics well, well it'll be interesting to see if they can hold that crown now that a lot of other shooters are catching up but you know it really call of duty showed that like and halo to an earlier extent showed that even shooters can be considered esports Absolutely, and and, uh, and just that, uh, like you said, running at sixty frames per second. I mean, just it, it uh, without the starting, it just it, it doesn't. Um, 
take you out of that experience uh, just with it running smoothly it if it were to, to stutter if it was running a little bit lower I mean it just it's it, there's it would create that a bit of a disconnect you know it's it's, it's one thing that, that uh, Call of Duty and especially I, I think where they hit that sweet spot was uh, more and more to yep. I mean that, that just came right, right solid all the time right? yeah yeah yeah, you know, that's the thing. When you have fast-paced, twitchy-based esports competition, you need to be running at a high frame rate. Like, look at all these fighting games. They all run at 60 frames now. You know, they have to because if you have a stutter, it's just not going to make sense. Again, when we're talking about people watching frames, studying mm -hmm. character motions, it all plays into it. All right, so that was number 10. Uh, let's take a break, and we'll come back for part two, numbers four to nine on our top 15 list of the characteristics that made games truly legendary. Stay tuned. We're coming back for more. I'm Mike Frisios. I'm Joe Morin. We'll talk to you in a bit.